Hello and welcome. I'm Jackie Lockie, your financial planning maestro. This series of podcasts is aimed at existing financial planning professionals, as well as those looking to enter the financial planning profession. This particular series of podcasts is focusing on financial planning businesses. We share new ideas and challenge your thought processes to help you improve your service to your clients. We have some amazing guests lined up, helping you look at things very differently. I hope that you enjoy today's podcast episode. Hello and welcome. I'm Jackie Lockie, your financial planning maestro. And in today's session, I have a very special guest, the person who actually launched your Financial Planning Maestro's podcast back in September 2021. And that is the Chief Executive of the Financial Planning Standards Board in Denver, Noel May. Hello, Noel. Hi, Jackie. It is great to be back again. And it's great to hear how successful your podcast has been since last I was on. Thank you very much. Uh, no doubt, in part down to all of your efforts and our kicking off our very first interview, which we had lots of fun um, doing that interview, didn't we? We did, for sure. <laughs> so we are back again um, to look at how things have changed during the pandemic as far as the global numbers of CFPs are going how the, and, you know, to seek your views about what you think the future looks like for financial planning and for CFP professionals worldwide. Um, And um, so I'm just going to dive in and start firing some questions at you as always. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Um, So, you know, we've talked, and I think you've been talking, you know, as a network of CFP professionals around the world about how the pandemic has started to change the way that we give financial planning advice um, in the various territories. Um, can you give us a feel of what the, you know, the member organisations are saying about how the pandemic has changed things? Yeah, well, you know, if if we look back, um, to to some extent, I think the pandemic has been almost a a catalyst for moving some of the shifts that were taking place in the financial services community for some time. And it just, I think, sped up a lot of, of those processes. So fundamentally, my view would be that the process of financial planning itself has pretty much stayed the same. It's more that the environment in which financial planning was being practiced and to some extent how financial planning was being practiced was what has changed substantially. And I think to some extent, um, a lot of improvements um, as a result of what has had to take place during the pandemic. So, So for me, foremost, I think what the pandemic did was it really highlighted and heightened the value proposition of financial planning, of having and sticking to a financial plan, Um, of having that trusted advisor on your side to take care of you. Um, And certainly, I think, as people were grappling with, you know, concerns around health, concerns around employment and money, concerns just around social um, aspects, uh, it it was an opportunity for people to sort of reflect on life issues, on financial issues, and that's that beautiful marriage uh, that is financial planning. So, so for me, it was the an opportunity for the CFP professional community around the world to step forward, to to take their clients by the hand and say, "I'm here for you," um, and to some extent, sort of step up their game in terms of the emotional connectivity to clients, making sure that they were really listening to their clients, listening to their clients' concerns. Um, and and sort of what we've often called those soft skills, but really um, ensuring that the value proposition they were delivering to their clients was not just around digging in on the financial side, but also just there being um, a support and giving their clients a sense of confidence and security that they had a plan and they could get through this pandemic together. Um, and and so and so for me, that I think was that was pretty consistent around the world as to and whether and how actual planners in their territories adapted their specific practices. You know, we could touch on that a little bit, but for the most part, I think it was really this idea that 
this connectivity that was largely virtual, largely by you know Zoom or Skype or whatever, um, that's not going away. So, so I think what was demonstrated clearly through the pandemic is you can maintain and have relationships of trust uh, with your clients by digital means. But certainly, it was it was harder to do with new clients. It was more straightforward and easier to do with existing clients. Yeah. Yeah. And I think some of the themes in the UK certainly have been that um, new clients have come on board um, and actually just accepted that they will have a, you know, a Zoom meeting rather than a face to face meeting. And in some cases, they've preferred to have a Zoom meeting because it means that they don't have to, you know, tromp off to, you know, a planner's office you know, basically spend half at least half a day out, um, unless right. they were going out for, for a jolly somewhere. Um, but but they could actually have the meeting that those meetings are actually being shorter meetings because you didn't have some of the uh, you know, some of the pleasantries perhaps that you, you normally start off with when you arrive and and meet new clients. So that's certainly been quite quite interesting. But I think one of the issues that we've seen here is, as you mentioned there, taking on new clients and some of the financial planners, some of the CFPs have said to me that where there is a, a connection to an existing client, where the, that's been very easy. Um, and a number of CFPs have said that, you know, they've gained new clients in their 80s and 90s, all done via Zoom, which mm -hmm. you think is absolutely amazing, isn't it? That, you know, yeah. all these people around the world could just go click um, and actually being able to, you know, get our heads around the technology and actually to be able to deliver, you know, that personal service, but but over Zoom. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, that was sort of maybe the sort of the notion at the time was, well, younger people would gravitate to online and younger people would be more comfortable. And what was evident across all of our territories was clients of all ages um, were comfortable with the engagement. And as you said, when it came down to the option of not having to drive downtown and park, um, it actually became infinitely more attractive. Um, the, the other thing for me that I think was sort of highlighted during the pandemic was, you know, there was this shift away from sort of the plan or having the big book of a financial plan, like a hundred page plan coming slamming down on the desk um, towards shorter plans. But, but I think with the increased use of technology, we're seeing a much bigger shift to that collaborative tools and collaborating with the client and you know the client gets on and starts moving you know this dial up here and changing a retirement age and saying but what if i don't go on holiday and and to some extent maybe adding not only an element of participation or more active participation with the client but i'm going to go so far as to say maybe even fun and, and I remember um, during our World Financial Planning Day event last year, we had Amy Richardson on from Schwab. Um, and that was one of our themes was that actually financial planning can be fun and working on your future and working on your future together with your planner should be something that's enjoyable. And so I think this, this sort of electronic environment, which I think can be replicated in an office person to person as well, but giving, giving the client the ability to say, let me have a go at this too. I think that's really sort of taken a leap forward um, yeah. during the pandemic. And that probably helps the clients understand things at a deeper level, doesn't it? it you're not just kind of being presented to and then go, mm, OK, well, that looks kind of OK to me. Um, you know, being actual, being able to kind of get in in the bowels of a system and, and fiddle with it, for want of a better expression, um, I think does aid that understanding. And I think also the connection with the planner themselves as well. A hundred percent. And and it goes to the very nature of financial planning, it's about the interrelatedness of areas of your life. And it's also about the fact that, you know, choices you make in one area are going to impact the other. So the, so the client actually gets to see that live with the planner. And then it suddenly it's not the planner saying, well, you can't retire here because you have to do that. The client's seeing it themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And it helps make those choices, I guess. It's, you know, life's about a trade-off, I guess, in many respects, isn't it? And the, the client thinks, okay, well, if I 
tweak that dial. And yeah, like you're saying, I don't go on holiday this year. Um, although I'm sure that's probably I'm going on holiday this year. I, I, <laughs> I, 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 feel, high I, water. I feel, Jackie, seven billion people are going to go on holiday this year. They're like, we are done being locked in our houses. Uh, you, you know, the, I will say, you know, another thing f- from the pandemic is, I do think it's been um, a pause for everybody, like in their lives. I think, you know, we're all, we've all been on our little treadmills running along. Um, And I, and I think what the pandemic did is it created a very required pause for people to go, actually, what is important to them? What do they want to do? And, and I think they found walking in their neighborhood, talking to their neighbors and looking at birds and foxes, was actually very uh, fulfilling and not terribly expensive. Um, and so I think what another outcome I think we're going to see coming out of the pandemic is, you know, this idea of the quality of life and the value of the financial decisions you make on how people want to live their life. Um, I think that's going to become, it's a more comfortable conversation and, and and I think we're seeing it across all age groups as well. And, and certainly, I would say, if you think of, you know, the, the focus on things like ESG, um, you know, I think what the pandemic has done is this really showed us we truly are a connected world. And maybe, you know, we're delicate and it's precious and, and we really should pay attention as we go along. And I yes. think I, th- I think that, you know, CFP professional community can help their clients really live their best lives now and for the future as well. Yeah. And I think, you know, messaging like that, living your best life now, that it, mm-hmm. that because of the pandemic, it, it seems to resonate more because we, you know, we've been forced to get off our hamster wheel, like you say, and pause and reflect. And I know that a, a number of clients of financial planning firms, certainly in the UK, I'm sure it's reflected across the world, have, have kind of gone in and said, you know, I want to retire early or can I retire now or you know, setting more travel plans um, for when we're allowed um, to be able to get out there and see, you know, spend more time with our family or take them to special places. Well, and, and, and you know, if you take it down to a, a slogan level, um, you know, we used to have a slogan around our consumer promotion activities and it was plan well to live well. And, and it was very much, if, you, if you're a good person and focused now, in this distant future, you will live well. Um, and we changed our slogan um, because of the context of COVID. And we changed it to um, live your today, plan your tomorrow. And, and we basically brought planning forward to say, it is actually about living your life now. Um, and, and as I think about sort of an evolution and a shift, for the clients in financial planning, I I just think younger generations are not interested in this, you know, 40 year on the treadmill with this glorious retirement for 10 years. Um, they, they really want to make choices, make smart choices now, have the experiences they want to have at each stage in their life. And that's another opportunity for financial planning. It's to say planning is for now and the future. You can do both but you got to do it within the context of a plan. Yes, yes. And I hope that one of the positives that comes out of the pandemic is that the CFPs around the world will be focusing more on younger clients because I think, you know, there's certainly a tradition in the UK that you have to have, you know, half a million pounds worth of assets in order to warrant the fees that financial planners are charging and that maybe there is a way and there is a more appetite now and therefore they're more likely to spend the money to be able to invest in, you know, simplified systems to help the younger generation before their finances get too complicated so they can really understand what financial planning is. Oh, look, that's that's a massive topic that's being discussed within the FPSB network right now and by affiliates in each of their territories. Like, I think the whole issue of access, affordability, and inclusion. So not not even talking about younger people, but maybe historically underserved or excluded communities, bringing them into the financial advice fold as well. So, so I think we're, we're at a, a point where there's heightened awareness about it. And now I think what we have to do is spend the time to say, okay, how do we partner up with 
either financial literacy groups, how do we partner up with allied professions, other associations with employers? Uh, you know, my, my fantasy, quite frankly, would be that all the world's employers, but certainly the world's largest employers, make financial planning a baked in element of the benefits package and that yeah. every employee can get the access of a certified um, to a certified financial planner professional who can help them um, get, get their lives in order. And that's really seen as just a right along with the idea of you have the right to access healthcare and you have the right to access education. I'd love to see that same right to access to financial planning. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, here, here. And I think, you know, where does that start? Where does the conversation like that start? I guess you're you're looking at, you know, the biggest firms and the, you know, the big bosses in the big firms. If they haven't felt what financial planning is for themselves, what real financial planning is for themselves, then they're probably not going to sing the praises and and warrant, you know, the expense of adding something like that to the, you know, the staff portfolios. Yeah, and look, that's back on all of us. And by us, I mean FBSB at the global level, our affiliates, including CISI in the UK at the territory level, and then each individual um, that is a CFP professional. Um, we've got to keep promoting the message of the value of financial planning, the value of having a financial plan, the value of working with a CFP professional. And, and our experience certainly has been that while people may not understand or be aware fully of what financial planning is, once they experience it and once they have an opportunity to work with the CFP professional, they love it. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the, as you said, the, the opportunity for us is to sort of step in to um, activities and programs and situations where we can expose um, those in decision-making uh, roles within large corporations or in associations or in society at large on what is financial planning and, and, and what is the value of it for people. And so it, it, it's a process. Um, yeah. and, and a lot of our affiliates, particularly in our mature markets, and I know I, that uh, CSI does it in the UK, you know, it can start with some pro bono initiatives. Um, it can start with financial literacy initiatives. So a lot of our groups connect in with consumer protection groups, with governments, with media on that kind of work. And ultimately to have that migrate from sort of episodic educational opportunities into a built-in wellness program. I think that's where the opportunity lies. Yeah, yeah. And that's quite quite interesting, isn't it? Because I know that obviously we have Financial Planning Week here in the UK and World Financial Planning Day that we all get involved in as well. You know, mm -hmm. but it's just one week out of the year, isn't it? This is about what are you doing the other 51 weeks of the year? Well, I love where you go with that, Jackie, because <laughs> that, that, that has been our conversation. To some extent, look, I love that we launched World Financial Planning Day. For, for me, you know, I think we're going into our sixth year. And so, you know, six years ago, there was no day in the world dedicated to financial planning. And so I think it's great uh, that we got that kicked off and sort of catalyzed a community of interest around that day. But to exactly to your point, the conversation now for us is how can we take that energy and that excitement that we build around World Financial Planning Day, leveraging off the financial planning days or financial planning weeks we have in each of our territories, and how can we just have a steady campaign of positive, engaging messages going out um, on a regular basis to say, this, this shouldn't be a chore that you save up to do the uh, Wednesday of the first week of October. Uh, this should be um, a great opportunity to put your life in order and, and get the life you want uh, through financial planning all through the year. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. And so talking of all through the year, let's look at you know, what the FPSB and the C Certified Financial Planner numbers are, because um, they have been released, haven't they, for the end of December 2021. Um, and they're globally, the totals are up, aren't they? They're totally up. And I would say, Jackie, your timing was fortuitous <laughs> with, with your podcast, uh, as in, uh, I, ha I have news to report since we literally launched uh, the, the year end numbers yesterday. <laughs> um, and so I am delighted to report that we 
topped 200,000 CFP professionals globally. At the end of last year, we ended up with 203,312 CFP professionals all over the world. Um, And that was a net gain of about 10,500 CFP professionals, a a 5.5% growth rate, which was double the previous year. And and for me, of course, what's, what's very rewarding is to see you know, we've doubled the number of CFP professionals since FPSB was created in 2004, but even greater uh, since the CFP certification program first went international in 1990, we've increased the number tenfold. And, and this increase is coming from emerging markets, developed markets, mature markets. And so it really speaks to, again, the value of financial planning and the interest in CFP certification all over the world, really to some extent catalyzed um, and supported by the pandemic. But but I, it's also based on the trends we're seeing and the feedback we're getting from the affiliates. It's looking like this growth is going to continue uh, for a substantial period of time to come. And shout out to uh, CISI and the program in the UK. Um, uh, we added, uh, we had a net gain of CFP professionals in the UK last year. Um, and so we ended up the year in the UK with 900 CFP professionals, which was a growth rate in the program there of about 3.7%. So really, really good news for us in terms of how the, the, the players in the marketplace supporting training, how the individuals seeking certification, how the affiliates um, flexing their programs to adapt to a COVID environment we're really able to not only maintain, but to substantially grow the programs last year. Yeah, yeah. And is that picture reflected in, you know, some of the smaller affiliates across Europe? Yep. So um, as you mentioned, so, you know, some of the programs in Europe are smaller than, let's say, our program in China or our program in the United States. But what we had is across the seven organizations that are broadly defined within the European region, the majority of them actually grew their programs last year. Um, And so that was that was a great trend for us. Um, And and also just, you know, we've had some initiatives where because some of the programs in Europe have been around longer, more mature programs, there's always this balance between the retiring CFP professional community and onboarding new people. So even in some cases in territories where they didn't grow, it was because they did actually add new CFP professionals, but then because they're a mature market, they had some retiring as well. So we we wrapped up a meeting with the European affiliates a week ago. And again, there's a strong interest on the part of those groups to connect the efforts more fully in the region and to really leverage off each other's experiences and learning to support each other in growth as well. Mm. That's great. That's great. And I think it's good that you've got, you know, pockets of neighbours who are, you know, willing and able to support each other. Because I think, you know, the because now we're 27 different territories, um, the CFP is, isn't it? And so being mm-hmm. able to have, you know, different affiliates to to ask for help and ask for support in these different territories, I think is, is an important, you know, essentially a free resource for some of the smaller affiliates. Look, and I would say that isn't something that's just, um, that sits with the affiliates. I think an amazing part of the global financial planning community of the 200,000 plus CFP professionals is that sense of community and that sense of sharing and that sense of building each other up that's been there right from the very start. So when when I first got involved in this in the early 90s, um, just the fact I could pick up a phone, reach out and ask one CFP professional to help another, and they would just, they would do it at the drop of a hat. I think that's baked into the DNA for the affiliates. And and for me, I think that's been a major um, motivator for our growth as a global profession as well. It's just that sense of the pie can be made bigger if we all work together. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and I guess we need to bring the regulator into all of this. Um, you know, must we, in... must we, Jackie? <laughs> <laughs> yes, unfortunately. <laughs> um, you know, I know that we've seen in the UK, I was reading an article, well, a 
consultation paper that the FCA put out only a couple of weeks ago saying that it would actually prefer regular one-off advice rather than ongoing review service for product advice. And I just wondered what your review, what your your own views are on that, because I was frankly shouting at my phone when I was reading it. <laughs> Well, and look, it's interesting because I always feel like any time there's a conversation that involves the regulators, I think it's always good to start by saying, you know, the regulator has a uh, a public interest and a public protection function. And ultimately, you know, what, what the regulator is seeking to do and what the FCA in the UK is seeking to do is to protect the public. And that's, guess what, a good thing. And that's something we should all support. Um, but to some extent, for me, a, 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 and as I understand the issue, and I will say, Jackie, when I first read it in the UK, I did a double take because, again, I, I read it and I was like, what? <laughs> what is going on? Um, and, and as I dug in, my understanding is, to some extent, what the regular in the UK is saying is, look, we don't think people paying money for services they don't receive is right. And, and I would say to you, who would disagree with that? As yeah. in, ab- absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, what I will come back and say is, how is the discussion being framed up? And is the framing of this notion of it is better to get episodic advice, that's the best way to go. Do, do I like that? Do I think that's the right way to go? No, not at all. No. And, and it's, you know, if you think back like almost a decade ago, with the retail distribution review, uh, to me, it's almost the same framing issue. Like if you remember at the time, you know, the it was the FSA at the time was coming out saying, okay, we're going to really look at the delivery of advice in the UK. And then they called it, in essence, the retail product distribution review. Yes. And if, if you remember, there was all this craziness around You've got restricted people and independent people, and the independent people are the ones who are beholden to tons of product providers. And you just, you kind of came away going, what are we trying to tell the average person in the street who's looking to engage an advisor for advice? And so I kind of feel like it's a little the same issue here. I I, I feel if you said to the public, um, there's people who sell products and They're good, and that's what they do. There's people who sell products, and they give a bit of advice around those products, and and they can steer you in a good direction. And then there are people who don't even talk to you about products to begin with. They talk to you about you, your life, your goals, your dreams. They put together a plan, and then they fit the products in. And if that was the context within which at least the conversation was starting, then you could come back and say, okay, now, what do I want to pay? What am I paying for? What's the value I'm getting? And what do I want to do? Yeah. And, 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 and for me, that's the conversation I'd love to have and the positioning I'd love to have in the marketplace. I'm, it, it's not great, in my view, that the regulator is going out to the public in the UK with a message that basically said the best way to get advice is episodic mm. and ir- irregularly. I, I don't believe that's true. Um, I, I, you know, our research and our experience and certainly people who've been exposed to financial planning and working with CFP professionals is actually making independent and episodic decisions within the context of an overall plan is going to set you up for better success. Yeah. And and, and so for me right now, I've seen I've seen the debate start and it kind of almost now creates this oh my God, we must resist, we must fight back, and we must disagree. And, and where I, I feel we, we need to get to is to reframe the issue. Be- because you know, around the world, models are changing. Business models are changing. Charging models are changing. So we, we have CFP professionals who are charging hourly fees. We have CFP professionals who give episodic advice. We have CFP professionals who charge retainers, and there's value for that. And ultimately, uh, you know, the regulator's job is to <laughs> regulate, oversee the market, create the framework for practice. But but I'd love if the conversation was framed differently so that the opportunity um, for educating consumers as to what it is they're getting and what they're paying for could, could become the focus. Yeah. And that's really interesting because it's, it's the kind of crux of the problem, isn't it? Because, you know, 
consumers who are, you know, that kind of mass middle market that we quite mm-hmm. often talk about here, our big advice gap that we have the world's biggest advice gap, I think, don't we, as FPSB Europe always used to remind me and have a giggle at, um, that that actually it's it's all of those people who they don't know what financial planning is. And so even knowing what your options are, there's that unconscious incompetence in that they don't know what the alternatives are and therefore it's hard for them to put any value on the service that they're looking for. And when they come across an advisor, they they can't see where that advisor might slot in, you know, in those kind of three scenarios that you described. Right. And again, to me, so much of it then also goes to the context. So, you know, if you take a profession we're all very familiar with, you take medicine, I, I can go to a doctor for an episodic um, situation. And that is, I have a sore throat or my foot hurts and I can go and I can engage the doc- doctor and he can give me, or she can give me episodic advice and I'm all good. But I haven't lost sight of the fact that there is a, a framework and a guidance of overall healthcare that permeates my life. And I know I'm meant to go out jogging and I know I'm not meant to eat that second dessert. Um, and, and there's a context of this it's health, it's episodic healthcare taken within the context of overall health. And that's and that's what I kind of feel is missing in the way it's being framed by the FCA right now. I mean, it's very hard to compete when the regulator's going out saying episodic advice is best. And in <laughs> yes. fact, it isn't. <laughs> it isn't. Um, and I, I, you know, an example I would give, like a friend of mine um, has a concierge doctor. Um, and, uh, you know, you literally pay a flat fee. So let's say it's $15,000 for the year. Uh, if you see the doctor never, you're still paying 15000 a year. But on the flip side, if he calls the doctor today, the doctor will come to his house this afternoon. So if you ask my friend, is that value? He's going to say, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, that's, and that's the issue for me. And I, I think you hit the nail on the head. We should get the conversation back to value. You should definitely be getting value for what you pay. You should definitely know what you're paying for. But I would, I would love if the regulator would partner with the financial planning community, the CFP professional community in the UK, and reframe it away from episodic advice is best to, in fact, advice from somebody who's competent and ethical and who works in your interests and who actually takes a long-term view of, of your finances. That's best. And then the episodic advice in that context, great, go for it. Maybe we can set a little to-do list. I love to set a little to-do <laughs> list for all of our CFP professionals and say, you know, think about how you present your own business proposition. Can you do anything either on social media? Um, you know, if you talk on radio stations or more generally in the media, writing newspaper articles, you know, can you help influence something like that? And, and that's perfect, Jackie, because that, you know, we now have 203,312 influencers. And, and I think the best individuals um, in a position to communicate to the regulators what is financial planning, um, I'll bet tons of your CFP professionals in the UK either have clients who work in government or regulatory authorities or who have family members who do or who know somebody who do. And what we have to do is just get the word out tangibly. What is financial planning? What does the CFP professional do with clients? How does planning make people's lives better? And, and the other sort of pitch for me is just really getting clear to the regulator, a community of professional financial planners, a community of competent and ethical CFP professionals is probably one of the best consumer protection moves a regulator could make. So to a large extent, as a regulator is focused on, you know, enforcing compliance and catching the bad actors, uh, one of the best things they can have by their side is the community of CFP professionals doing great things every day for their clients. And, you know, I'll say something potentially provocative, but that's what podcasts are for, Jackie. Um, (laughs) Absolutely. uh, (laughs) Like, I, I literally remember... You know, 25 years ago when I first would go in to meet with regulators, and I would always start off wrong. 
um, I'd literally say, so do you know what financial planning is? And invariably, guess what they said? <laughs> yes, yes, of course I do. Of course we um, do. And halfway through the conversation, I realized, no, they didn't. And then I'd have to reverse my way back into trying to re-educate them so I could have the conversation. And, and that would be my pitch to the CFP professional community in the UK, the CFP professional globally and the FBSP network is to, to go into our environments, not saying, hey, do you know what financial planning is? But to go and say, hey, let me tell you what financial planning is. And it's pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. And that leads me nicely on to talk about the future in 2022 onwards. Um, mm -hmm. What have you got on our to-do list for CFP professionals like me and all of our listeners out there um, for 2022? What's the FPSB up to? Big stuff, big stuff, Jackie, um, and exciting stuff as well. So um, as a lot of the CFP professionals in the UK probably know, we did um, a global job analysis research last year. We dug in deep with over 16,000 CFP professionals um, across 16 territories into what is the current practice of financial planning. But we also did a future financial planning practice survey with over about 4,200 CFP professionals in 24 territories. We're going to take all of that data into the current practice and the anticipated practice of financial planning and we are going to do an overhaul of our competency framework and global standards for the practice of financial planning. So we're going to sort of dig in, make sure our standards are fit for purpose, make sure that we are focused on evolving practice needs, building in sort of the more human aspects of financial planning, looking at ESG, cryptocurrency, evolving topics, and then also in particular, looking at how the next generation are going to be coming into careers in financial planning. So that's going to be a large project we're going to undertake. We'll be sharing out uh, the information with the network, seeking feedback. And our goal is to have this document that really is easy to understand. It's easy to communicate. And it can then become a tool for all of us to use with clients, employers, educators, regulators, really communicating this is the practice of financial planning. This is what it's all about. Mm -hmm. So that's one. Um, another is we want to really step up and make sure we're doing a good job communicating the value proposition of being a CFP professional. And, and I think it's important for us that CFP professionals in the UK feel part of a global community and that they feel that they have access to information and resources and best practice sharing, which we talked about before, from their peers around the world, but also that the affiliate organization in each territory, CISI in the UK, is integrating and coordinating with its peer groups around the world. So collectively, we're just building that resource bank and tools to, to continue to promote the practice of financial planning and one of the things um, that our affiliate CEOs are interested in is looking at practice aids or tools or resources that can help CFP professionals be better and work better and more effectively with clients in their day-to-day -day lives. And then the probably the third big project we've got is just in the area of consumer promotion. And and what we are looking to do is each of our affiliate organizations, so across the 27 territories where we've got programs, there's various consumer promotion initiatives underway. We're looking to create um, a lot more integration and coherence in those campaigns and in those messages so that we can really amplify the share of voice for the CFP professional community in each territory and globally when it comes to people interested in looking for information on financial planning and you know, we just set out a campaign um, literally yesterday uh, promoting the global growth of CFP certification. And for the first time, we actually put together um, social media tiles and messages that CFP practitioners themselves can use in their own social media. And we, so I would encourage all of your listeners, um, all of the CFP professionals in the UK and those beyond um, to use those tools and to join us in getting out the word that there are now more CFP professionals than ever to serve the needs of clients globally. 
and I'm one step ahead of you because I have already reshared all of that information. <laughs> but I love it. I, I love it. <laughs> I will attach it again to the uh, show notes of this podcast episode as well for those CFPs who might have missed it. Um, so that sounds like a, a whopper of a to-do list for you. Um is there anything in particular that you would like our CFP professionals in the territories to think about themselves? Anything that specific that you say, okay, I'm going to give you a task, you know, I love a to-do list. Um, anything little that, you know, they need to start doing. I guess it's more, you know, getting the message out really, isn't it? And explaining really how that value of financial planning can can help clients. Well, well, I suppose before before I give anyone a to do list, <laughs> I think start start with something nice. So I I'd, I'd probably start with a a big thank you. Um, I, I I think we cannot do what we do when you and I promote financial planning and we promote CFP certification. At the end of the day, it's the individuals who gave up their evenings and weekends, studied, got the certification, keep the certification and do great things by their clients. So yeah. I just want to say massive thank you to the um, CFP professional community in the UK who are now part of a much larger global CFP professional community for what they do. And so first and foremost, I would say keep doing what you do because that totally helps um, FPSB promote this global profession. But I would then, my, my to-do list is something that says, probably get involved um, to the extent your your practice can accommodate you doing um, either volunteer work or pro bono work or participating in our financial planning weeks. If it's even retweeting what Jackie retweeted. So I don't know if you can retweet a retweet. I hope yes, so. You can. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and honestly, it's, it's just, if you have, um, the idea is if you have a practice tool that's pretty great, you know, committing to to sharing that and getting that into the system in the UK, which can then feed up globally as well. Um, our goal is that we work together to be the profession, the most compelling profession for people. So we've talked about medicine, people have got law, accounting down. For me, I think financial planning is quite frankly the most uh, it, it's just the most critical uh, function and profession, and we can play an amazing role in the lives of millions and billions of consumers around the world. So just get involved to the extent you can, um, share, share your views, share your thinking, and together we can do great things. Thank you very much. Noel, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. As always, thank you for sharing your views and uh, of the regulator and everything else. Um, and uh, hopefully we will catch up again soon. Absolutely. And if the regulator is listening to your podcast, I love regulators. So all good, all good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks a million, Jackie. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. It's really interesting, isn't it, to listen to other people's points of view about different things, all relating to our wonderful financial planning profession. If you know anyone who might be interested in listening to any of these podcasts, please pass on our details to them. So that's it from me. Join me again next time when we'll be talking all things Certified Financial Planner related and also dropping in on our new entrants to the financial planning profession. Bye for now.